Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Look, I get a lot of emails. Most of them are about how I'm going to hell. But some of them are about why and how and when are we going to have Dr. Justin Sledge back on the show. <laughs> so that, that people are right about that. It's a good idea. You know, they're probably right about the other thing too. So welcoming back to the show is actually Jason, who's back from exile uh, out there in the uh, the outer darkness in the abyss. He's come back to the Floroma of Talk Gnosis. Is and, that what we're uh, calling Dublin now? That, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, Dr. Justin Sledge, who is going to be talking to us about the Cathars. Uh, we were talking about before the show, he, he doesn't have a degree in Cathar studies, but he uh, has an interest in his well research, and we're going to have a great discussion about that. Uh, Dr. Sledge, please bear with us because we have to do a little bit of inter internet begging first. Uh, we can't do the show without your financial support. Help us out by going to patreon.com slash you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that and just give us a buck a month. I think a buck is the lowest amount that Patreon allows. If, if possible, I would take your 50 cents. You can also do <laughs> one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Okay, uh, Dr. Sledge. I do uh, like how you guys actually have like Patreon slash Gnostic. Like, it, like you're at the ground level of... Uh, it's not like Gnostic Kitty 19073. Like... Yeah. You really have like a just it's not it's not paypal.me uh, uh slash gnostic six nine six nine. Yeah. <laughs> uh it, it's also a bad sign because we check the number of pay we love our patrons. We have some super patrons, thank you very much. We've had some super one-time donations, but we've been running for like more than a decade, and there's a reason why we have that uh patreon.com slash gnostic, and nobody count how many patrons uh patrons whatever you call them, patrons that we have. Uh, yes, that's it. But yes, we're very proud of that. We wish that we could have Gnostic.com. Unfortunately, we're GnosticWisdom.net. Don't go to GnosticWisdom.com, uh, although we try not to slam other groups uh, who use the, the name Gnostic, even if they're not. Okay, Dr. Sled, <laughs> talk about groups that may or may not be Gnostic. We, we have done programming about the Cathars before, but we did a show on Cathars and the Tarot. We did a show a long time ago about the Cathar diet. We tried to do the, well, there's not really archons, in, maybe there is, in, in Catharism. Uh, we tried to do a show on the Cathars, but there's a bunch of technical problems. We tried to edit around it, but the show's all choppy. So, it's the finally archons. happening. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Give yeah, us so, the elevator pitch on, yeah. on who the Cathars are. So I guess before I do that, I just want to say that I am not an ex I'm not a medievalist. I'm not an expert on the Cathars. My I'm much more strong on uh, late classical Gnosticism. Um, but uh, I do know something about the Cathars. I've studied them a bit. And I've had uh, I had a heresy studies class once, which is just the best thing. I mean, sells itself. Heresy studies. Um, but the um, the Cathars are a purported, and I, I want to put the word purported there because I'm going to come back to that in a minute. They are a purported dualist variant of Christianity that um, thrived uh, beginning in the 11th century, um, maybe late 11th, um, and then came about really into their own into the 12th and 13th. And then um, and primarily in Southern France and Italy, and then were destroyed by the by the institutional Catholic Church uh, through the Albigensian Crusade, which lasted for 20 years, and the Inquisition that followed. They are, according to the traditional view, um, a dualist variant of Christianity that held that um, God and the devil uh, were distinct ontological uh, beings in opposition to one another. So dualism. Now, it began with a moderate dualism. It evolved into an absolute dualism. That moderate dualism is usually attributed to the influence of the so-called Bogle Mills from out east in Bulgaria, who also may trans, uh, trace their lineage back to the Paulicians and maybe even back to the late classical Cathars as we know them, or the late classical Gnostics as we know them. The idea is that the devil, uh, Satan, was a pre-existing entity, just like God, and that Satan ascended into heaven, waged war against God, stole souls, a third of the souls of angels, out of heaven. Those souls were implanted into human beings, trapped into human beings, and that the physical world is the creation of the devil, um, and that physical world is a kind of prison, which is down pretty familiar for folks in this channel, and that Christ... Um, who is uh, a, a, is a diminutive figure of God, uh, 
we are told in uh, some of the literature that Christ is not a um, co-God or co-equal homoousios person of God and some of the heresiological anti cathar literature that Christ created an alternate dimension. That's not quite the way they would put it, but an alternate reality, an, al an alternate cosmos of pure spirit. And in that world of pure spirit, um, he's incarnated, which is a strange thing to say. He's incarnated in that world of pure spirit. And somehow, and this is the most murky aspect of Cathar theology, somehow he dies and defeats the forces of evil and then liberates some of the people, some of the people, some of the angel people that we are trapped in our bodies and um, eventually sets the stage for the redemption of human beings. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I say purported and I'm putting a lot of caveats here because what's, what's important to know about Cathar studies is that Catharism and the Cathars as we know them are basically a 19th century invention. What we really have is a ton of heresiological literature from the time period and a few things allegedly written by these dualist heretics. Uh, and I put heretics in square quotes, right? I don't really mean they're heretics. That's just what the Catholics call them. So we have a little bit of literature. We have a ton of heresiological literature. We have some confessions, mostly arrived at through torture. And it's from that giant field of information that in the 19th century, scholars built the idea of Cathars and they described the history of Catharism. In the decades that have followed, especially beginning in the 1990s, there was a relook at all of that literature. And there has been a emergent camp of people who are called the skeptical camp. So what we have is the skeptical camp and the traditional camp. The traditional camp holds, they were dualist, Cathar, Christians who represented a counter church to the Catholic church that was imported from Gnostic ideas from uh, Bulgaria, eventually reaching back into the classical world. And that counter church formed a full blown Catholic, a uh, full blown counter church with a distinct structure, ecclesiastical structure and, um, and a sacrament or a, a sacrament uh, and some texts that were important to them. That's the traditional view, that they were a full-blown counter-church movement. The skeptical view holds that's not true. The skeptical view holds that the, her the heresiologists were, and also some of the political stuff at the time we can get into, that they actively were seeking out what was a variant of Christianity, and that variant of Christianity they labeled as Catharism, as Manichaeism, actually, and that they ultimately waged uh, a crusade against them and they wiped them out. But there was no Cathar church there. There was a tiny fraction of dualist Christianity, perhaps, and that tiny fraction of, of dualist Christianity uh, was itself never organized into a kind of counter church. So we have two really, really opposite poles here. We have the traditional view, full blown counter church with a bunch of mythology now attached to it with Mary Magdalene and all kinds of Holy Grail stuff. Right, it's good Dan Brown, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, conspiracy theory. It's, there's all kinds of great, there's all kinds of great History Channel stuff over there. Um, and then we have now the skeptical camp, which is a rhythm that says all of that really completely misses everything. But that what we're not we're not dealing with another version of Christianity here. We're dealing with a tiny group of dualists, um, and that and and those dualists are certainly not a counter church by any stretch of the imagination. I'll be very transparent about my position on this. I learned in my heresy studies class, right? The traditional story. And that was a story that I accepted for a very long time. I've read a lot of Cathar literature. I love firsthand literature, secondary literature. I've read a lot of primary texts. I've made episodes on my channel, primary texts. I have increasingly come to believe that the skeptical camp is closer to the truth, mm. right? I don't think that there are radical skeptics to say there were never any dualist Christians even at all. That seems completely bogus. That's not unbelievable to me, because uh, we have literal book, Christian dualist texts written in this time period. Um, so that seems unlikely that it's, it's a full-blown conspiracy theory. But I think what we really have here is something like an, a medieval conspiracy theory with a kernel of truth. And that kernel is not Catharism. Yeah. It's something much more subtle. So I want to be really clear about where I land. Um, and also, as we have a conversation, what I want to do is I want to try to represent both sides 
uh, equally. Because I think it's really important that in a debate, when a person's, when an ex expert is being interviewed, uh, it's really important to try to represent the strengths and weaknesses of both sides of that, of that debate. So right now, the, right now there's a debate in medievalism between the traditionalists and the skeptics. Traditionalism is represented by, I think, the majority of the literature, both in English and French, but the skeptical camp is now an emergent alternative position, uh, both in the French literature, actually began in the French literature, um, but it is now also in the Anglophone and Italian literature that the, that the skeptical camp is, um, is increasingly uh, getting some foothold. And that's also true in Gnostic studies too, right? With uh, yep. folks like uh, Bernard Williams. And, uh, but I think that the position held by the skeptics in the, in the most Cathar debate is a much stronger position than even something like Bernard Williams. Mm -hmm. So that's just worth pointing out. Yeah, no, that, that that's fascinating. And, and uh, oh wait, ah, that's fascinating. And uh, I, I have heard those theories and I have some appreciation for both sides because a full-blown counter church, that, something about that doesn't quite strike me like as correct it, it doesn't seem that feasible to me but I, i'm going to be fascinated to sort of hear you uh, uh say both sides of the debate and i you know i don't want to be the guy who says truth is somewhere in the middle every time but i bet you sometimes between these two spheres might be more correct but i won't know until i get that time machine so <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I and again i said I, i'm much closer to the skeptical camp now yeah. uh, than i was uh earlier in my life and uh yeah, I go into why I believe that. And also, if folks want to check out, I, I made a whole episode about this debate on my channel. And if folks want to dive into that debate, I provided uh, both an episode, a 45-minute long episode going through that argument for both sides and providing primary and secondary literature so that folks can explore um, the arguments for both sides. And I think it's really important to, to, to do that, to do that work. Yeah, there's a... Uh... Oh, I'm just going to say we're going to link those. And we'll already do the plug for the people not listening and watching. That's youtube.com slash esoterica channel. But I'll link those specific shows. Jason, on leash. <laughs> uh, oh, no, I was just going to say the, the whole thing there, too. But, like, uh, I always try to beware of uh, of stories that, that seem too good to be true or are, are sound um, just awesome enough to validate all of the things that I want to be true, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, so it kind of to Jonathan's point, like, you know, you don't want to just be like, it's probably somewhere in the middle, but it's also like, if this feels like it's validating everything that I think is awesome, then maybe somebody's selling me something, you know? <laughs> yeah. And they really literally are selling you something. If you go to the pick Cathar, uh, if you go to Southern France, you can buy Cathar wine, you can stay in Cathar Airbnbs, you can go to uh, Cathar castles that were not ever built in that time period. Uh, <laughs> the, in the same way that the golem is all the big rage in Prague. Right, even though that story, the Golem story in Prague, was written by a non-Jew in the 19th century, had nothing to do with actual Kabbalah. Uh, you go say that in Prague, they'll throw you out, they'll throw you out of a window. Uh, you go to the Pe <laughs> the Pace Cathar and tell them that there really were no Cathars, and they'll throw you out a window too. Um, so, um, and yeah, and also it's just I think it's important, right? Like in the same way that we've now done really good academic research on witchcraft, and now we realize like the witch trials were a giant conspiracy theory that killed 60,000 women who were completely innocent probably most of them or never witches or whatever. Um, it's not surprising that the very inquisitional literature that set the stage for that was written in the Albigensian crusade, right? Mm. There is no witch trials without the Cathar hunts and there is no Cathar hunts without anti-Semitism on the part of the Catholic church. So you just begin to see like, oh yeah, the blood libel and Jews poisoning wells and eating babies. That didn't happen either. Uh, so mm. we begin to see a thread, right? Yeah. And also just when you torture a bunch of people, and you know, I don't know about you, I don't trust those confessions. So mm -hmm. do we, we want to build a, a, do we want to build a story around that kind of stuff? No, but do we have a lot of options? This is the literature we have. And so, uh, so we have to go from there. But again, um, there are Christian dualist texts written in Southern France and in Northern Italy uh, that were confiscated by the Inquisition, quoted at length, um, that are clearly not forgeries and are clearly some example of Christian dualism that claims to have been influenced by Eastern folks like the Bogomils. So something's happening there, but a counter church, probably not in the same way that there isn't a worldwide Jewish conspiracy, the same way there isn't a world, a, a European wide witch heresy trying to destroy Christianity in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about this literature? And you talked a little bit about some of this this wild mythology. And of course, whenever yeah. we get into Nausicaa stuff, the mythology does get pretty pretty wild. Although but, not as wild for the Cathars as it does for the Apocryphon of John or the Valentinians. And that's one of the things that's really important is that... So I should just lay this out. There is There are no quotations from Gnostic literature, classical Gnostic literature that we know of, right? To be found in the actual works of Gnostic of the Cathars. Yeah. So, if if a Cathar, a 13th century Cathar, were quoting the Apocrypha of John, done, <laughs> done, right? We, we we know there's a connection, right? Or the Valentinians, or whatever. Uh, even even Bogomil, something. We, there would be a much stronger piece of evidence. We don't have that. They quote the Vulgate. They only rely on the Bible that they had, which is the the Vulgate, and so it's. We don't see them quoting much of that, with one exception, which is a, a text called The Vision of Isaiah, but that text isn't Gnostic in any... We, we don't find it in, in Nag Hammadi, for instance, uh, or any of the, the Bruce Codex, Askew Codex, the Codex Chakos or whatever. So it's not... And it's never mentioned by Irenaeus or what Hippolytus. So, again, this is where things get really, really muddy. And we don't see the classic... Um, Demiurge stuff, with the exception of Satan creating the world, right? So that's kind of demiurgish, demiurgish. Um, but we don't get <laughs> syzygies, we don't get Sophia, we don't get pleromas, we don't get, you know, we don't get the very baroque systems that we see in the Apocrypha of John or Valentinianism or other kinds of. It, so it's it's for me, it's also conspicuous what's, what's missing in these stories. But if we got those, if I got a mythology and there are fifteen different pairs of syzygies or something, I'd be like, oh, there we go. We're dealing with some remnant of Valentinianism, right? Uh, or if I got something Yaldabaoth, right? If I got anything like that, I'd be like, ah, we're, we're in some apocryphon of John Sethian territory. Yeah. We don't get that, which leads me and some other folks on the more skeptical camp to come to the idea that this is an independent form of dualism or what I would call indigenous dualism. And I think that's, even if that isn't a connection to Gnosticism in, in, the, in the late classical world, I think that's actually more impressive. Yes. That means that indigenous Catholic people or Christian people in Europe with some contact from maybe a mild dualism from the outside coming from the East developed almost a similar system indigenously in the Middle Ages. I think that's actually more interesting. Yeah. Well, I, like I, this, I, oh, go ahead. this sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I'm diving in on a lot of stuff here, but like this is actually one of the things that I've been really thinking a lot about um, uh, is, is an idea of a Gnosticism as a like there's Gnosticism as a as a wrapper or envelope around a particular period and around a particular series of texts, but then there's uh, like Gnostic as a genre, where um, there is a sense of like an emergent property to that, like. Uh, uh, that you know, you you put enough humans in a in a particular situation over enough time, and general ideas will form. If that makes sense, right? Like um, you, William Blake can be vaguely defined as Gnostic, even though there's no evidence that right that he's connected exactly. to anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I would call that what I would call that is uh, I, w I would use a really ridiculous academic language for that. I I call that a structural homology. Is uh, I borrowed that term from biology. It's so a structural homology in biology is where two similar body parts evolve independent of each other, right? So the eye is a great example, right? Our, the, the eye has evolved a, a dozen times, whatever, independently. So the creatures who have eyes may have no relationship to each other, right? Hmm. And so the eye, because, you know, you know light-sensitive material is structurally is, is, is evolutionary advantageous eyes develop in the animal kingdom even though creatures you know or you know bacteria have no eyes and so we all evolve from eyelessness and the eye evolved repeatedly but there's no connection structurally between there's no connection causally between the various eyes that developed um, so that's called a structural homology and what i would argue is that we might get structurally homologous idea systems too and I think mm -hmm. uh, Gnosticism, right, which is, you know, we can talk about what that might mean. I think that these can develop independently of each other. Uh, I also, uh, John, let's put a, put a pin in this here. I want to do a whole show on uh, using the metaphor of the eye evolving repeatedly due to light. 
as a Gnostic metaphor. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah I, I was just going to mention the the cheese and the worms. You know that book, Doctor Sledge. Yeah, yeah. Which is a great example of what you're talking about. Which is, you know, people. Uh, the Jason. It's a book about a, a heresy of one, right? Uh, about right. A, a Milner who who creates a, an elaborate mythology because right. people are creative, right? And you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, the Doctor Sledge. You mentioned they have no Gnostic text, but they have the Gospel of John, which, if it's not Gnostic, has some perspectives that you can that that are Gnostic. -y. Yeah, sure, I you, think it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. take a lot. Of of, it doesn't take a lot of like pushing to get the New Testament to be dualist. Yeah, I mean that's that's not a hard push. Uh, no, and and they did have texts. Um, they did have texts that are at least the o oldest texts that we have from the Cathars aren't terribly Gnostic. I mean, there's we can kind of read back into them dualist stuff, but what we can definitely say is that uh, by the by the middle period of Catharism, Catharism, again, I'm, I'm putting this in square quotes and I don't really mean to be dismissive, right? Yeah. I'm trying to, I really want to be diplomatic that if Benjamin Franklin, I quote Benjamin Franklin, I'm American. Uh, Benjamin Franklin <laughs> uh, famously said, right, that if the British won't find a rebellion in Massachusetts, but they might make one, Yeah. right? The Catholic, the Inquisition might have not found Cathars in the Languedoc, but they made them. Right, and so by the time that we see these this literature evolve, we do see the development of, of hardcore Christian dualism um, in a text called the Manichaean Treatise that we have at least chunks of, and then the Book of Two Principles, which is full blown, systematic, deeply thought out dualism. I mean, some of the most impressive, I would say, the most Im rigorously impressive arguments for dualism ever developed until Descartes. Right. Mm. So, uh, so that text it, it runs seventy pages. I mean, it's a it's 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 a substantial piece of literature um, that shows evidence of education, probably in Paris. The person who wrote it clearly has some scholastic education. So that person's clear, and it's written mostly in Italy. We think Northern Italy. That person clearly is a is a systematic dualist, arguing for dualism as a self identified Albigensian operating in Northern Italy. Um, so. I don't know that I don't know that it was I don't know that a full blown dualism was ever there, but the Inquisition created one, and hmm. uh, and that's a sociological thing we see, right? That um, you might not have terrorists in an area, but if you send in anti terrorism units to torture people, you will create terrorists. And I think that yeah. we have something. I think we have something similar. Uh, we you know the United States learned that lesson the hard way in the Iraq insurgency. They you know they tortured people left and right with waterboarding, and you know they were like, oh they're you know, we, oh, we found the terrorists. I'm like, I don't know if you found them, but you made them, yeah. um, you know, uh, with ISIS and things like this. And I think that in, in a similar way, folks like Bernard Guy and the Inquisitioners that ran into that area, uh, who were all the happy to, to engage in, in uh, horrific human rights violations, uh, massacres, I mean, just straightforward massacres of people. Uh, I think they created the very thing that they were hunting. Right. Um, so you think you people know, got more dualist? Sorry, sorry, Jason. After experiencing uh, the, these early inquisitions, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, dualist. Yeah, let's say let's say you're a moderate dualist. Let's say that you are sort of an a, 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 an indigenous French moderate dualist, and that's not an unbelievable thing to do. I mean, frankly, most Christians are probably moderate dualists. Yeah. Right. Most Christians are probably moderate Marcionites. <laughs> yeah. Like if you just like go to the American <laughs> South. They're like, well, I love New Testament Jesus. He's great. Now, old, the Old Testament God is terrible. They're like, they're already kind of crypto Marcionites. Yep. So, you know, like that's already there. Like, I think if I wanted to form an Inquisition and go find Marcionism in Mississippi, I could find Marcionism in Mississippi, right? So, already do it. And then you would create Marcionism, Mississippi right, Marcionism. By hunting, yeah. by hunting it. Yeah. And so I think that what happened was there's already moderate dualism there, maybe imported from Bogomilism, right? From this is an Eastern kind of moderate dualism found in, in, in Bulgaria. Even that connection's weak at some level. And I think what, what probably happened was the Inquisition created what they wanted to hunt. And not only that, uh, but the church was actively interested in the crusade in that region uh, for both uh, financial, political, and spiritual reasons. And the very people they enlisted to lead the Albigensian crusade that massacred people at length, uh, the, you know, I'm sure you guys know this famous quote, right? Uh, uh, Kill them all, God will know his own. 
quoted famously by one of the crusaders at the massacre of Bézier. The people that benefited the most from the Albigensian crusade were the church who consolidated enormous plantation power in that region, but also the Northern Lords who destroyed the Lords of Toulouse and the Lords of Carcassonne and stole their lands. So when I, when I just see like a bunch of land up for grabs and you can use the cover of religion to do it, I mean, it just, that just looks real uh, convenient. <laughs> uh, convenient. And also that when they sieged Bessier, uh, just give one example, right? When they sieged Bessier, um, we know that was not a total Cathar stronghold, even by local, but even by contemporary sources. The Catholics in Bessier, which were probably the majority of the people there, held out to fight. That tells me that the Catholics, the real the Catholics, Orthodox Catholics who were in Bezier, were not trying to defend Cathars. They were trying to defend their their land not being stolen. They're trying to defend not being massacred with a with a conspiracy theory. So so yeah, I I'm again, I, I'm increasingly not buying the Catholic cover story. But at the same time, do we have Christian dualist texts? We have a handful, literally three. Right? Yeah. We have literally three texts. Now that's not to say that's not to say that there weren't more, but we do have uh, uh we have, we have some moderate dualist texts and we have two distinctively dualist texts. And we have two Cathar ritual texts, one in Latin and one in Occitan, um, that were extracted during the Inquisitional process. And you, you can you can always wonder about texts extracted extracted through the Inquisitional process, by which I mean torture. <laughs> um, so we can wonder about that. Uh, we can certainly wonder about that. But there's enough there there that we need to to take it seriously. Yeah, uh, we should back up a, a little bit, Dr. Sledge, just for people sure. who, who are unfamiliar with the topic. So we've been using words like massacre, slaughter, and crusade, but but you don't mean those figuratively. So can you oh, tell no, us I, about... Yeah, 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 it, yeah. Is, it is... It is they're they're, 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 so after the Fourth Crusade, which people should always know, the Fourth Crusade was just Christians murdering Christians to pay for the Third Crusade. <laughs> uh, it was mostly cr Western Christians attacking Constantinople to expropriate funds to pay for the Third Crusade, which also tells you, by the way, that these people were perfectly happy to kill Christians. Yeah. That, that's not, this, this is not even like we're killing Muslims to take the Holy Land. This is like we're, we're engaging in like extortion uh, against other Christians. So they're comfortable killing Christians already. What ends up happening basically is that there is rumors of heresy in the region. The Pope at the time sends um, uh, monks and other educators in the region to diagnose the problem and then to treat it through discussion. Mm -hmm. That fails, right? And then what? Then a, 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 pa a papal legate gets murdered, right? It's always the one thing. So papal legate gets murdered, not that it was hard to get murdered in the Middle Ages, not that it was hard for papal legates to get murdered because, you know, they're fabulously rich or whatever. So he gets murdered. They blame him on the Cathars. At that point, uh, a new pope is, uh, comes to be, and he just turns the volume up to 11. And he basically argues that this Cathar uh, heresy is uh, destroying Christianity in the region, and he argues for a crusade, right? And so, and then what what is launched is the Albigensian Crusade, and that Albigensian Crusade um, spans twenty years. It's a yeah. twenty year long war, an open war, in which northern French lords are basically given writ writs of war to legitimately raise armies, and then engage in military combat against civilian towns. I mean, we should just call it what it is. This is just soldiers laying siege to civilian proper civilian areas and massacring them uh and again i gave that famous quote right uh the kill them all let god will know his own so this is not this is a this is the same kind of horrific stuff you've heard about christians doing in jerusalem right where they just murdered everybody in jerusalem once they got there in the first crusade but this is just happening in christian lands this is genocidal violence, um, assuming they were Cathars. But I think what's really more terrifying, it's the same thing that's true, of, so, prof so profoundly terrifying of the witch trials, 
is that obviously no one should be killed for witchcraft. I mean, whatever. Believe what you want to about witchcraft. But those women weren't even witches. They were just women who owned a little bit of land and owned, lived by themselves and maybe mouthed off sometime. And they were just massacred by these witch hunters. The people at Bézier, the people at other places that were the Carcassonne, other places, I mean, uh, Montefort, they were just burned alive by the tens of thousands. Um, and their lands were expropriated and the church, the church and the Lord's benefited all the way through. So the skeptics argue that this is not about Catharism. This is about land acquisition. This is about political politics. This is about the politics of religion. Um, what's also really important to know here are two things that are worth mentioning that are uh, historically important here. This crusade didn't happen in a vacuum. There are two really important things that are happening here. One is the Gregorian reforms. The Gregorian reforms were a situation where um, uh, Pope Gregory and, and the remnants of Pope Gregory really pushed through the idea that local priests and bishops should have a lot, lot more power than they had previously. We shouldn't imagine the Catholic Church of the 11th century, the 10th century, the, the 12th century as hegemonic. Yeah, The Catholic Church was powerful, but not super powerful. They weren't telling you how to live every aspect of your lives. And there was a wide range of heterodox beliefs. I mean, go to the University of Paris in the 13th century. They're teaching open avarism, avarism there. Yep. Right. So there, the church is not the all powerful tendrils into everything belief that people have. That's more of a 15th century thing. Um, and so the Gregorian forms were very unpopular in France. And the Languedoc, in the area that Catharism existed in, was very independent, very autonomous. It still is. They, that whole area still is, is sort of the, you know, the Basque countries down there. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is an area that isn't culturally French in a lot of ways at that time, uh, Frankist. And so the Gregorian reforms were basically being pushed down the throat of that region, and they weren't happy about it. And so anti-Gregorian reform, heresy, Catharism, again, the dominoes, you can see the dominoes begin to fall. So that's one thing that's worth to know about this entire cultural and historical moment. Uh, the other thing that's really worth mentioning about this sort of cultural and historical moment um, is that insofar as that they are beginning to attack the, the, the so-called Cathars, is that the, the Northern Lords stand to gain a ton from this. And the, the Catholic Church is, is, a, is all, let's see how to put this better. The Catholic Church is dealing with a bigger problem. And the bigger problem that the Catholic Church is dealing with in the 13th and 11th centuries is the whole claim of apostolic poverty. Apostolic poverty, led by the Dominicans, the poor Catholics, and other kinds of movements, terrifies the church. Because the church is, if anything, fabulously rich, especially in France. They own massive plantations, and they did until the French Revolution. The one thing they don't want are highly popular movements pushing for the idea the church must be poor, by definition, by apostolic definition. And we have a tradition in the Catholic Church of what is called heretical poverty. So the Beguines, the Bechards, uh, the Cathars, the Waldensians, who we haven't mentioned yet. There is a huge St. Francis of Assisi, the, the Franciscans, yeah. the Dominicans. Apostolic poverty, right? That concept is terrifying to the institutional church. And so they have to deal with it. They have to deal with it. And what they do not want, right, is any group doing, claiming legitimacy through apostolic poverty. And what we see actually is through the period of the, of the process of the Albigensian Crusades, the Catholic Church allowing certain groups to be poor on purpose. The Dominicans are the famous example, right? The, the Franciscans, right? The poor Catholics, who was a conversion, a convert of, Waldensi, of uh, Waldo, Peter Waldo, the Waldensians. And so part of what I think they're actually combating here in the, what the Catholic Church is really worried about is not dualism and Gnosticism. I don't think they give a damn about that. I think dualism and, and whatever, they're, it's a minor problem they can deal with that. I think what they're terrified of is these groups' commitment to radical apostolic poverty at the church level. And what the way the church dealt with that was to say, hey, you Franciscans, you Dominicans, you guys can be poor, right? Like that's voluntary poverty. And voluntary poverty, even within, a, within an organized group is okay. Right, but they claim that the whole church needs to be radically impoverished. That's heretical poverty. So, 
that's a that is a weird debate that most modern people have no idea about because we don't think of the we don't think of the of this as a, a social movement but the church dealt with this for hundreds of years beginning with the franciscans and all the way through the bechins and the machards and so i think that even more than the dualist problem um the dualism is not what worries the church it's a it's it's a poverty argument and that's exactly why they send the dominicans they allow the dominicans to be poor right and then they send the Dominicans in to fight them. Why? Because the Dominicans can claim we're poor just like you. We have nothing. We have, you know, we have we're we're committed to poverty too. We're committed to chastity and poverty. We're committed to all the things you're committed to, but you're recalcitrant heretics, right? Because you refuse to bow, you refuse to include yourself in the mother church. So you can't use your poverty argument against us anymore. The church engaged in what I would call perfect in, in, in counterinsurgency. So once the massacres had ended, the 20-year massacres of the Albigensian Crusade, once that ended, then the Inquisition comes in. And the Inquisition can always claim, we're poor, we're pious, we're celibate, we're all the things you are, except for you believe wrong stuff. And we can, we can torture you, we can fix you. So I think, again, we have to understand these debates and in, in the radical historicity of, of the church and i think that debates around apostolic poverty i think go well over the heads of most people these days because no one ever thinks like i mean there is no radical apostolic poverty movement in modernity no one there's no one out there being like the, the pope should give up his you know or the church should give up their money maybe they are yeah, but it's not a yeah. radical movement the way it was in the middle ages the catholic workers <laughs> movement is the only one i can think of but yeah. uh the and, uh, and, yeah. and, the, and the catholic worker movement was was still very very systematically i mean targeted i mean yeah. i think they produce more martyrs uh in central america than than, than, than a lot of other movements so it still is a, a lingering issue yeah. so what i want to point out is just that to get at this right one can think they're being persecuted because they're they're gnostics I think they're not being persecuted for that insofar as they're being they're The real, I think, worry is that it's part of a larger persecution around this ap apostolic poverty business. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and stealing land. <laughs> we really need to do a, a show on St. Francis someday, but I'm not the first person to observe how close he came and his movement came to being branded heretics, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, or yeah. the, the Bikins and the Megards, Meister Eckhart. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the Gnostics even claim Meister Eckhart, like modern Gnostics even claim yeah. Meister Eckhart, yeah. right? And he's he's his his mysticism is deeply influenced by Bechin, Bechard. Um, in fact, he was sent in by the Dominicans <laughs> to be a watchdog over those to ensure not doctrinal consistency, but that they weren't preaching apostolic poverty. Yeah. Right. So, so talking about the, the, this, uh, this, this poverty, uh, the, the perfecti, the supposed perfecti. I'll, I'll put, I'll put uh, adjectives before yep. and uh, 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 scare quotes whenever I say things. But who were the perfecti said to be, uh, Doctor Sledge? Yeah. So it's funny you say perfecti because you, then you're naming the women, right? Um, yeah. So uh, mm. we're, we're we're talking Latin here, so we would say for the men at least the perfecti. Uh, the perfecta would have been the the women, uh, the women of that, which we do know there there were some claims to have been perfecta, although the, they're they're mentioned very rarely. Um, we're told by you know, we're told in the literature that the Cathars did not have priests; they had these people called perfecti, and perfecta, men and women people. And what these people were were people who had received, uh, who had undergone a very specific ritual in the Cathar Church, and again with all quotes or whatever, called the consolamentum. And the consolamentum was the, allegedly the only uh, sacrament provided by the Catholic Church, or the Cathar Church, sorry. Whoops. The Cathar Church. And the consolamentum was a, um, was a uh, extirpation of sins, a kind of baptism by the Holy Spirit in which the, a, a book, uh, the Gospels, uh, were laid on the head, and there was a laying on of hands, and at that point, you were purgate, you were expurgated of sin, and you were perfect. You were Cathar, you were pure. That's where the term comes from, right? From Greek, right? Uh, you were you were pure, and it was in that position of purity that you could be said that when your your physical body died, you, that your soul would escape out of this physical world, and you would go on to the world of perfection created by Christ. Uh, in the Cathar literature, the Book of Revelation, where you get the depiction of the perfect world. That perfect world, according to Cathar theology, already exists in a different realm, and you go there when you die. 
So Christ had already, the, the apocalypse had already happened and you will go there when you died. Uh, it's a perfect non-physical realm. Now, the consolamentum is an interesting thing because it, it generates the perfecti, which are basically the, the, the leadership, allegedly, of the Cathar Church. Now, the Cathar Church actually had a multi-layered leadership. If you listen to some of these heresiologists, uh, typically there's a four-layer level. There are the perfecti, the older and younger, younger sons, and then the good Christians. So the good Christians are civilians. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the older and younger uh, sons are sort of something like uh, episcopates and deacons. And then the perfecti are, they function a bit like bishops. But again, this are, who knows to what degree that's really true. Um, so what would happen is that the job of the perfecti would be to give the consolamentum to people near death right? So that if you were near death, you would be completely purified of sin when you died so you could escape this realm. Um, now, that's actually not that, un if you think about Catholic rituals, that's not that unusual from just regular old final rites and, and things like that. Um, the big difference, actually, between what we can tell the Cathars and the Catholic Church is that if a perfecti if one of if one of the perfectus, if a, if one of the perf, if a perfectus, uh, or if one of the perfecti were found, to, let's say I made let's say that I am a perfectus and I made you a perfectus, right? And we're all perfecti now. So let's say I made fifty perfecti, but it turns out I had sex with a woman right before I made all you guys perfecti. Um, all of your perfecti status is destroyed. The my moral and spiritual character. Can it's you? I can only create more perfecti if I am in a state of perfection. Now, this might sound really familiar for my fans of St. Augustine out there. This is called the Donatism heresy. Donatism was the idea that only that sacraments could only be provided by a person in the state of sanctity, right? And, and what ends up happening is St. Augustine argues against this and says, No, the God sanctifies the sacraments, the priest himself. Uh, is not, doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, you don't even need a priest for some sacraments like marriage. Um, he's married in the woods or something. So this led to a kind of donatist problem and actually led to several schisms actually inside the Cathar church, which is interesting. Um, and so we have this group, the perfecti. We do know of some perfecti, right? Perfecti, T-A-E, right, in Latin. These were women perfecti. We have a handful of mentions of them. They, we don't have any mentions of them making other perfecti, other women perfecti, and we have no mentions of them making other perfecti. So there's a lot of stuff in the literature about how the, the Cathar church was completely egalitarian and everything was equal and it was like a social justice woman in paradise. We don't have any evidence of that. What we have is there were some perfecti and they were lower level members of the Cathar church and it seems like they function basically as deaconesses. Which, by the way, we have lots of evidence for in the early church as well. In fact, deaconesses were the building block in many ways of the early, of the early uh, Orthodox church. So we have this group of people, the perfecti. We have them giving the sole, sac uh, sole sacrament of the Cathar church, the Casalamentum. Um, there's one more ritual that we have in the church called the Melioriamentum, uh, which is um, it's, not, it, it's a kind of acquiescence before authority, which there's a debate about if that was a sacrament, it probably wasn't insofar as any of this is. So um, what we have in the Perfecti is, is this. Now there's also a mention of another ritual called the Endura. Um, the Endura is a ritual mentioned, I think just by one or two of these heresiologists. And uh, the Endura is a situation in which a person who's ill is given the consolamentum, which is to say they're perfected, but they might survive their illness because, you know, people do that. So you, you euthanize them. You, you, you accelerate the process of death. And that's a big no-no in, in Catholicism, right? As you might know, that's a big no-no. Uh, Catholicism is not about, uh, you can't violate natural processes like that. And so this ritual, the Endura, um, there's different stories about it. One version is that you drink wine made of with crushed up glass inside of it to kill you, basically. 
Um, there's a lot of rumors about this, but we see no no Cotho, no people who ever tell us that Cothars ever mentioned this. And the only kind of people that mention this are also the kind of people that mention all kinds of other, you know, that Cathars engage in homosexuality. And there's no difference between having sex with your mother and sister and your wife. And it, so we, we get a long list of things that the co evil Cathars do, and the Endura is one of them. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, and even in medieval Catholic stuff, there are situations where a person is unconscious and sick. And is it a question of like, if you do, should you withhold fluids from them? Like if they, if they're coughing it up, you know, and so was the Endura one of them? Who knows? Um, the Consolamentum looks a lot like sort of lay Catholic stuff in general. Um, but I think what's interesting is the Donatus problem that the Cathars seem to have independently come to the idea that if a perfectus makes other perfecti in a state of imperfection, all of the imperfecti, including the other perfecti made by those perfecti, ain't. And this led to a huge, because one of the, apparently one of these Cathar guys had sex with some uh, a prostitute or something and it like mucked up their perfecti making. Yeah. Uh, that happens to all of us. <laughs> Jason, do, do you have anything to, do you have anything to let loose? I uh, well, one thing that I've been like as we've been hearing some of the some of the history stuff, and then some of this like um, uh, the and again, actually, kind of going back to what we were saying before about uh, that emergent property of how uh, there's sort of emergent um, sort of similar uh, uh, theological problems that they that they encounter, like this this thing with the the perfecti having imperfecti problems. <laughs> um, yeah. <Don't> uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I, uh, before we before we run out of time, I think like, um, and we we've discussed a little bit about their their um, their actual like sort of mythology or, or you know um, uh, like their narrative. But I wonder if we could get a bit of a, a breakdown of just what that narrative was. So we don't have a we don't have a, a running text. Uh, what we have basically are, are two texts that seem to describe Cathar theology. One is called the the. Um, uh, the book of the book against the Manichaeans, like the Manichaean treatise, and the other is the book of two principles. Um, um, I, I, I summarized a little bit at the beginning of sort of their general the general overview. Um, but there are Christian dualists who believe that Satan and God exist independently, that Satan invaded heaven and that stole angelic souls out of heaven, a third of the souls of heaven, and that um, that those souls are are basically all human beings. And that they re they believe it seems they believe in reincarnation that you get reincarnated until eventually you were uh, until you were uh, until you're redeemed. And the consolamentum seems to be the mechanism by which one is redeemed. Now there's a big question about how, how is that Gnostic, right? Because we think of Gnosticism as kind of a you have to it's about knowing something, but here it's a sacrament that saves you. That just sounds kind of normally Catholic, right? Um, and so it's not, not, it doesn't seem Gnostic in the sense that you need to know something. Um, and you get even further difficult theological complications in, in, in Catharism as well, specifically about the crucifixion of Christ, because uh, there are Gnostic texts that seem to indicate that Christ never even came here. Um, that is to say, in the physical world, there's no incarnation of Christ at all. That Christ's incarnation was in another realm to kind of make a world for us to escape into. And Christ never came here. In fact, um, one of my favorite lines, I think from the, the Manichaean treatise, I think it's the most infamous line, is that, uh, that, um, that Jesus uh, flowed through Mary like a, like a water through a pipe, that she was only pregnant for two months and he sort of flowed out of her and then kind of was here and kind of wasn't. And when we get to the Jesus stuff in Catharism, that's where things get the most complicated and we actually have the least data because it, they want to seem to have their cake and eat it too, because we all do, that they kind of want him to be here kind of as an illusion. And that's kind of docetism kind of, right? The illusion stuff. Um, that he's kind of here, but he's really in the other realm. And, um, and his crucifixion, which they agree something got crucified and he did die something died 
And somehow that did fix something. But at that point, it's all hand waving. <laughs> right? It's all in all the Cathar literature, it's hand waving. <laughs> we just don't get any systematic theory of what's going on there. Um, it's certainly not the atonement theory, but they do admit something died. In fact, the ascension of Isaiah, the vision of Isaiah, it's all about Jesus like descending to earth and then dying and coming back up. I, mean, I told you so. Um, <laughs> which is the greatest told you so ever. Um, so, the, the, and again, this is the thing, right? And, and what we have in a lot of this is tortured confessions and, and text quoted by inquisitioners and we just don't have a coherent theory of what's happening. Um, and I, and I'd say, and I would say that's also true of a lot of text in, in the Nagamari library, like exactly what's happening with Jesus's execution is the most murky part of, uh, of all of this. Um, yeah. Whether he appears to suffer or doesn't or whatever. So that's where things get tricky. Uh, but regardless, the big fear, the, but it seems like no matter how that goes down, um, what seems to be true is that Jesus's execution allows him to destroy evil, like finally destroy evil. It allows him to educate people about the truth of the world. And that may be the Gnostic aspect that they're actually angelic souls trapped in human bodies stolen by the devil. And this world's not really real. That sounds good. That's, that's not Gnosticism. It'll do until Gnosticism gets here. Um, and, and then he kind of deuces out, and goes back up into the heavens, having created this other realm that we can jump off into when we die, so when we get the consolamentum. So, to me, none of that rely. None of you don't need any of that. None of that story relies on anything we know about late classical Gnosticism of any form: Hermeticism, Apocryphal of John, Sethianism, uh, Valentinianism. I don't, I don't, whatever, like we we don't need you know we don't need carpocrationism to make that story work. One could develop some version of that story just with the New Testament, I think, and I, I think that's what happened. It it sounds like regional folk religion, right? Yeah. When you describe it like that, it sounds like you know the experiences I've had with like people drunk at bars, you know, being like, "This is what I think is actually going on in the Bible," yeah. or like modern UFO religion, right? People are creative. You, you sure. give them. Give them some stuff, and and they right. can go. You know right. that that said, you know that the, the uh, having the Gospel of John, having the Ascension of Isaiah, having possible Bogomil connections. You know, maybe there's a little bit of interchange of ancient ideas going on. Yeah, sure. Who knows? And, and we uh, have the, we have the Secret Supper of John. That's also a text we know they have. And also, by the way, they don't have the entire Ascension of Isaiah. They just have one part of it, the uh, Vision of Isaiah. Yeah. And and of course, the Ascension of Isaiah is a very complicated text. It's a it's a there's early Christ there's early Jewish parts, there's like Christian parts, there's later Christian parts. That's a really complicated text. That was three texts meant like wed together and then separated again somehow. And the one part, the vision of Isaiah, actually makes its way. Um, there's an old church Slavonic translation and a Latin translation, both from Greek, and the Latin translation is the one that makes it over to France. So even that's so tortured in this whole story. Uh, but I agree. I, I think what we have is, in the same way that Gnosticism developed in the ancient Alexandrian complex, given the logic of Christianity and other kinds of things, I think what we have is a kind of Christian dualism, a moderate Christian dualism with some influence from the East that develops in northern France and, and northern, northern Italy and southern France, and the Inquisition, by turning, by, by turning the screws develops into a full-blown dualism because i tell you this if you want people to become dualists torture them yeah yeah and it's it really the, easy to believe that the world's evil when you torture people was the inquisition actually created to hunt cathars so um in a way yeah so it, the main inquisitional manuals that we have nicholas uh bernard Guy, uh, which is the first inquisitional manual we really have was developed in that region and nicholas emmerich is downstream of him and of course, those would go on to to become central in the in in that region. So, in some ways, the Inquisition was invented for two reasons. One was during the Albigensian Crusades, and the other, the dual other reason why the Inquisition was developed was to deal with Jews who converted to Christianity. It never hunted witches, right? It was never about hunting 
very rarely. In fact, I think the Inquisition may have saved more women in the end than it murdered as witches because of its appellate system and its evidentiary standards. It was mostly for hunting wrong Christians, right? Um, and so, yeah, the the major, the first real witch, the first real heretic manual, inquisitional manual, is Bernard Guy, and then Emmerich, and of course, Emmerich uh, is writing a century. Uh, uh, the last Cathars are really from the last Cathars we have mentioned are from the early 14th century. Emmerich writing in that century as well, and his text will be kicked over and in, uh, into into Ireland where there'll be the Alice Kittler trial, which is really the first witch trial in European history. And then the, the Kittler trial using the Emmerich manual, Disinquitorum Magicarum, Disinquitorum Inquisitorum, that will be, that will lay the groundwork for the juridical apparatus of the witch trials, which will eventually result in Malleus Maleficarum and, and those texts. So. Yeah. Um, I, I have it in, in my notes. Uh, to go back to the mythology or mythologies, and you know, there's some conflicting mythology, and maybe this is because of regional differences. Maybe this is because of things people shouted out during torture. Maybe this is the fevered imagination of heresy hunters. But but evil Jesus getting it on with evil Mary Magdalene. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, the, there's the, so the, this is a pretty famous. This is the most famous. And Bessar Begar Guy, he's probably he wrote a history of the Albigensians. And in that text, which is our is probably our most sustained uh, text of, of the of the Albigensian Crusades and the Inquisition that followed, we get a laundry list of weird stuff. I mean, laundry list. I mean, this is this is sort of like what happens if you just sort of call everything we got from the witch trials into one text, and you can imagine there's a wide range of things. Um, so there we get all the stuff about them eating babies and homosexuality and incest and and the Mary Magdalene stuff and um, so there's a one-off in that book and uh, you would be surprised that a one-off could spawn an entire romantic conspiracy theory world where Mary Magdalene is pregnant with Jesus and escapes to France and she's the Holy Grail and Dan Brown and don't, you know, um, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, it just, it's what's amazing about that to me is that that people read that literature so closely to find that one thread to write this very complicated mythology that is like now on the History Channel. Yeah. Like it's like the stuff of conspiracy theories. Like, like, and and I say conspiracy theory. I mean, in a wide range, like anti-Semitic, like like crazy Nazi conspiracy, like the SS Anambra, right? They were down in Qatar region looking for this stuff. So it's amazing how, um, how persuasive a lot of that bizarre stuff was. And no one ever thought to, thought to think to themselves, you know, if you torture people, if you torture me, like if you like literally like, I don't know, the standard torture of the time, I'm sure folks know, is a strapato torture. Uh, that's where you tie your arms behind your back, and then you lift someone into the air, and then you bounce them up and down on their dislocated shoulders, and you attach weight to their feet to do that. Um, all those torture museums you see in Europe are not really real torture. They, they, no one's going to put you in Iron Maiden, because that would kill you. Torture is meant to elicit confessions through pain, um, and the church can't let your blood, because that's considered to be immoral. <laughs> <laughs> somehow um so they they strapato torture you um i just tell someone just you know hold on to your arms and just let someone push your arms up behind your back like this just do that just let someone push your arms up and i bet they get about halfway up three-fourths way up and if if you let them you will you will be telling them you're you're the queen of england yeah. right if you imagine me bounced up and down on your, your dislocated shoulders for days in your own filth, uh, no food, no water. You're gonna, you're gonna sing. You're gonna, you're gonna say anything those people want you to say. And the fact that we take, uh, the fact that we would accept medieval torture testimonies as indicating truth, is bizarre. What's even more bizarre is that the CIA was doing this in the 2000s during the Iraq insurgency, yeah. waterboarding people, and then looking all over the world for you know whatever terrorists they could find and sure enough there weren't any um 
so yeah, I, I think that I'm not going to build a theory on one piece of evidence derived through torture written by an inquisitioner, you know, from an anonymous source we don't have access to. It's just not. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That's, we're going to start to get into wrap up territory, but, you know, while we're still on the subject of mass death and torture, uh, uh, <laughs> Shiri, <laughs> but Mata Seeger. Yeah. Uh, it, it's something that's you know captured people's imaginations uh, for for a long time now. The, a lot of romantic legends about it. What what happened at Montesegur? What was said to have happened? Yeah, so Montesegur happens after the the massacre at Bezier. It's basically a, it's 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 basically Montesegur is a uh, is a uh, fortified position. It's a castle. Uh, it was filled with uh, with regular Catholics, it was filled with refugees. I mean, the, the, the Albigensian Crusaders were brutal. And so when you knew they were coming in your direction, everyone fled to the only secure place you could, which was castles. And so this castle was just full of people. There was a couple of attempts at sorties out of it. And uh, just like Bézier, they all were massacred. I mean, there's nothing more to say about it than that, really. Um, it gets in, it gets, you know, both Bézier and Montsegur get, you know, get enshrined in some troubadour stuff about sort of the horror of all this. Um, and there's some meager evidence that maybe some Cathar stuff may have ended up in some of these troubadour things. Um, but I think the evidence is actually a lot lower than people think. Um, a lot of those texts are not really Cathar by any stretch of imagination. But yeah, it's just one of these situations where you, you um, yeah, you're talking about these sieges and Montsegur and Bézier are the two worst. Um, I mean, uh, Bézier really strikes me. I mean, I think they... They, by the time they got to Montsegur, I think they burned 20,000 people alive, yeah. something like that. Um, yeah, it just, um, it, the human suffering evolved in all this. And again, I think what's even more horrifying, and this is what's also true of the witch trials, is that no one should be executed for their religious beliefs, ever. Just, you know, you can, you can believe whatever bizarre things you want to believe. Um, but the fact that they didn't even believe it, that they were telling the crusaders probably through the through the siege we're not cathars like we're not heretics we're catholics um and them not caring and just burning those people alive um it's just it makes it so much more horrifying um but in the results of that stuff if there were christian duelists and i think there were christian duelists in that region it's not hard to become a hardcore duelist after seeing something like that. Yeah. Like, like if I weren't a duelist, and again, like, like as a, as a Jewish person, like it's not, it would not be hard for me if I were, God forbid, a Holocaust survivor. Um, if I saw Auschwitz, Treblinka, and I could easily believe that the God who made this world was evil. Like, how could you not believe something like that? If you saw the massacre at Bézier or Treblinka. Well, that's a that's a cheery spot to no. We won't stop quite there. Um, yeah. J Jason, do you have uh, uh, go? <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, I'm honestly I'm just kind of roiling around. I think the 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 ideas here. I think one of the things that strikes me most is how many, and I think this is both something interesting about the Cathars themselves because so much of what we have about them is what other people have said about them. Um, but also I think uh, Dr. Sledge, just your, the breadth of your information, the ability to see uh, echoes and resonances of what's happening or what happened with the Cathars as, as, as we know it and what's happening now. So I, I just think there's a, just some very striking resonances that I've been really thinking about, like how you create the thing that you hunt down, I think yeah. really strikes me. Um, I think, I think uh, that happened with, I think that the CIA basically admitted that happened with Al Qaeda, that Al Qaeda totally. basically didn't, didn't exist really until the CIA started hunting it and they kind of created it in the process of hunting it. And I think they've, they've, they've admitted that actually. And mm -hmm. uh, if you read uh, general Petraeus's counterinsurgency manual, he, he actually tells you that, uh, don't do that. Like, <laughs> like don't, don't create the thing you're trying to hunt. Counterinsurgency actually is meeting the insurgents on their demands and giving them their demands and then bringing in, bringing them into society to neutralize them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and what's interesting is the Catholic church did that with the Waldensians, the Waldensians, right? 
were another heresy of the time. They were they were uh, they were all about radical apost apostolic poverty. The Catholic Church hunted them in the same way they hunted the well, the, uh, the, uh, the Albigensians, not as ferociously. And uh, they eventually chased them into the mountains in Italy and left them. And they still exist. The Waldensians are still there. But the any Waldensians they would that, that that converted, they allowed the Waldensians to become what became the poor Catholic movement. They let them be a Waldensian inside the Catholic Church because they the Catholic Church wasn't stupid. They realized that you can't kill your problem away. You, you I mean, I, I think of that when uh, when uh, U.S. forces arrived in Mogadishu. Famously, they said, "Right, everything can be everything that can be accomplished by bullets has been accomplished in Mogadishu." And I think the Catholics actually realized that with the Waldensians, and they were like, "Let them be poor, <laughs> right? Give them poverty, right? Let them eat cake." And that not actually tells me that <laughs> let the, them not the, eat cake. Let them not eat cake. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, let them wear hair shirts. Um, that that's also telling me the Catholics really weren't there because. The Catholics were willing to deal with the Waldensians, right? And the Waldensians were a smaller movement, alleged than the Cathars. And I think, and that was a different group of people dealing with them. So it was the Sister Syrians mostly, not the Dominicans. And I think that what we got was that the Wald we know the Waldensians were real. They're still here. You can, yeah. The Waldensians are a big deal in the Protestant in the Protestant Reformation and stuff. I think that the Cathars were never really there the way that Bernard Guy and other these inquisitioners ever thought they were. And I think that they created them uh, both in their imaginations, like the witch hunters, but also in reality. And that's totally not deniable because we have Christian dualist texts like the Manichaean Treatise and the Book of Two Principles. Uh, that's the only two that we have distinctively dualist texts. Um, indigenous to those regions and that, that's clearly an evidence of dualism and, and not just dualism educated dualism um especially the book of true principles um yeah. so. the uh the i think the other thing that i think is, is is possible here too that i'm so like we talked a lot about how like when a when a larger force creates the thing that it's hunting when it's pushing against it uh but i i'm also thinking even too in, a, in, a, in terms of a present day how, how true that can be in almost any direction like mm -hmm how a lot of the conspirituality groups have like have essentially created uh um uh responses to them because they have because they have protested so loudly against everything if that makes sense like uh i don't know i don't know if this is too too political for the show john but like um we wouldn't we wouldn't need to mandate vaccines if people wouldn't like had such a problem with them if that makes sense you know like <laughs> the the reason it's a uh um it's become such a debate is because people are are uh um letting themselves be convinced by something and so then now there is actually some enforcement and then they're like see we were right it's like well no like <laughs> there was nothing there until you pushed against it you Look, know? don't email me email jason directly okay? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i just i think it is an interesting I mean, I think that's I, I, this. I, I do think it is interesting um, about how, again, like how social policies can often create the thing that they're that they're hunting. Yeah. Um, like, I think McCarthyism probably created as many communists as it stopped. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, that's another example of of that. Uh, the civil rights, you know, the suppression of the civil rights movement. Right. Like, the nonviolent strategy of the civil rights movement was to actually bait out the violence of the racist white supremacist system of the American South to show people it's violence to get mm -hmm. people to be against it. Um, the Bader Meinhof movement, right? The, the Red Army Fraction was meant to use terrorism to show that the German state was in fact actually uh, violently fascist underneath it all. And so that's like a self-conscious version of this whole thing. Um, I don't think we have anything like that. What I think we have is uh, in the Languedoc and in Northern Italy, uh, we have indigenous heterodoxy in which an escalating cycle of first the Gregorian reforms, then the crusade, then the inquisition eventually created the conditions for this. In the same way that I'll, I'll speak for, my, for, for us Americans down here, uh, United Staters, Right, 
there was no American Revolution on the horizon in 1774, right? It's as the British began to turn the heat up with the Stamp Act and other stuff that you began to en enable terrorists. They were terrorists. The Sons of Liberty were terrorists. They were tarring and feathering people, right? As you begin to turn up that with the intolerable acts, and as you begin to turn that up with you know, like suspending the constitution, you know, suspending the government of of uh, Massachusetts, as you like the the you know, Boston Tea Party, you have a tiny group of people, the Sons of Liberty, right? And and as you turn it up, it makes more people sympathetic to them, and eventually, right, you get a revolution. And even in 1776 in this country, um, the American Revolution was not popular. A third were for, a third were neutral, a third were against. It wasn't until Tom, Thomas Paine Common Sense in seven, the winter of 1776 that independence was even remotely realizable. And so, the, it, it, the, you know, of course, us Americans love to tell a story like, yeah, we love we loved freedom since we were Anglo-Saxons escaping from the Huns, right? Like, that's a delusional, you know, that's not true, right? So... Benjamin Franklin, I think, is right when he said there isn't a revolution in Massachusetts. If they're going to make one. There wasn't Cathars in Languedoc, but they made them. Yeah. You know, I, I'm really glad that we ended up with this conversation because I think it also illustrates how this weird stuff, and I'm putting that in square qu uh, scare quotes, uh, mm -hmm. I'm letting people know at home because we also release it as a <laughs> podcast, folks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how this weird stuff that we're into, well, the three of us and the people who watch, the people who listen, is so relevant and how it can really, how there are these resonances throughout history and how exploring these topics, really diving into them can, can show us something about the world that we live in right now. And, and I think that that point is really... You, really been expressed you know throughout this whole show but particularly how we're ending but on that note we, we should start wrapping up dr sledge uh we have been I, I opened up with a plug but let's do your plugs again where can people find you discover your work engage listen to your show all that good stuff sure folks can find my work over at uh at, if you just type in esoterica at youtube you can find me me there that's my only social media because social media is the the demiurge um and uh, otherwise, you can find me at justinsledge.com if you want to contact me and learn more about me personally. Uh, I have uh, uh, I have a growing group of Cathar uh, episodes. Um, and so I have, a, a, I have an episode on the Cathars as a uh, this whole question about whether they exist or not. And I also have a growing a three-part series on the Cathar scriptures, of which the third part is not done yet. It'll be on the, the Book of Two Principles. And then I'm going to be doing another uh, deep dive into Cathar um, ritual texts, which are the two ritual texts, uh, which describe the consolamentum, which survive in Latin and Occitan. Um, I'll be dealing with those later. Um, so if you're interested in Catharism, I'm doing, I'm, I'm really trying to build out uh, basically what is a pretty decent library of, uh, of at least Cathar ritual and scriptural texts. I'm not going to deal with the, uh, the Albigensian Crusade, that's really well covered on other channels. I'm not a military historian, but um, but if you want another short story, they just murdered a bunch of innocent people. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a very brief video. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's a bunch of northern lords killing a bunch of southern lords claiming they were Cathars. Okay. Uh, As my one plus does. Yeah, my <laughs> plugs are uh, marlinmeditation.substack.com. Uh, I uh, teach secular meditation. It's great for everybody, great for stress relief. I have some uh, training certification, mindfulness-based stress reduction. And every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we meditate online for free. That's 11 a.m. Montreal time, Eastern time, same time zone as New York. So check that out at marlinmeditation.substack.com. Uh, I'm going to school right now at the Global Center for Advanced Study, where I'm doing some... Uh, uh, theological and uh, philosophical work, which we'll be talking about on the show at some point, I'm sure. But I think it's a really cool school. They actually have a certificate program right now in radical theology. So if you want to find out why God is dead and who killed him, you go take that program. Uh, Jason, plugs. <laughs> Uh, nothing really new. Uh, SageTheater.com is the theater company that I work for. Um, we just had a really great production. Uh, so if you're not in Calgary, uh, then no worries. But if you were in Calgary and you didn't see it, sorry. <laughs> um, or in Dublin. Or in Dublin. Actually, yes. And then we just, I just came back from Dublin for a remount of another show that I'd worked on. So that's, uh, it's been a very busy theater week or theater month for me. 
but um, uh, but all that all of that's in the rearview mirror now. And now I'm getting ready for the Ignite Festival, which you'll see on SageTheater.com. And then uh, anything personal with me is uh, visible on JasonMemmel.com. Just uh, uh, just I'm sure it'll be either on the screen or there we go, um, or just uh, Google me. I'm the one that didn't go to jail recently. Oh, that's good. Obviously, yeah. see, I have basically an all Googleable name because it's so common. So, but he's <laughs> that's to Jason Mebel who didn't go to jail. That's a uh, three M's, three E's, uh, fourteen H's. Okay, everybody, <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for joining us, Doctor Sledge. Thanks again. This is Deacon John signing off. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs>